What's up guys, I'm Pause Build, and welcome back to our ethical zoo. Previously we've made a multi-species habitat that is now housing capybara, maned wolves, and giant anteaters together. And we've also built a beautiful building for our staff where they're gonna research our animals' welfare and a nice facility for our guests to get some food and drink. In this video, we're gonna be expanding the zoo by building a reptile house, so I hope you guys enjoy. It seems like everyone's settling into the habitat nicely and you guys gave loads of name suggestions for the main wolves and the giant anteaters. Look at all the babies, they're just so cute. And I noticed we've got a reduced, uh, a reduced crime, we've just not had any crime. We've got a reward though, so we might as well claim that, gets us a bit of cash. <laughs> And then if we release a giant anteater into the wild, we'll get one. Or if we earn a souvenir profit of $500. But we don't actually have any souvenirs yet. So we could think about a souvenir shop soon as well. Uh, we do kind of have enough guests to start warranting one. But for now, I think we're going to rename our maned wolves. Now they're all together. So our male is going to be called Stilts. Our female is going to be called Ginger. And the little Bubba is going to be called Loki. Then our giant anteaters are going to be called Squidward and Heather. So my plan is to build a reptile house over on this side of the zoo and that will pull our guests through our like commercial area with all the guest facilities and hopefully earn the zoo some money because basically guests get pulled through by animal appeal and every animal has an appeal rating. Like our most appealing habitat species at the minute is our giant anteater, but we don't have any exhibit animals to, uh, to pull them through either. And exhibit animals are really cheap because whilst habitat animals cost this amount to feed generally, uh, exhibit animals only cost, I think it's like 50 a month. It's like, it's super cheap compared to this. So it's definitely worth getting them in and they bring a lot of appeal. Depending on which animals you have, they can bring a lot of appeal to your zoo. Now we should look at our vet research as well. See, we've done some. So the main wolf has got some stuff. Have they got food level two yet? They've got food level two, cool. And they've got some more food enrichment and toy enrichments. Let's just have a look because we may have already unlocked it. Um, let's have a look at maned wolf. I don't think there's anything new here. I think we had all of this before, but that's fine. I didn't realize that they could use the aquatic jetties as well. I assumed that was for the capybara, but um, apparently not. Well, cool. They've got one anyway. So I'm going to go into zoo animals and select their food and change that to food quality too. So they're going to be a bit more expensive to feed, but it is better for the animals. And that's, that's the focus of this zoo. It's got to be ethical in every way that we can. Now, another thing you guys said was you should probably have like a feature tree in the middle here because it will provide some shade for the seating. And I think we will definitely do that. We should probably also put some, some shade on these seats so people can actually sit down comfortably. Because at the minute, it's like 33 degrees. Let's have a look at like the heat. Uh, the temperature. That looks quite warm. <laughs> That's quite a warm zoo. So uh, I think we do need to start thinking about the temperature. And I imagine our guests are probably complaining about it a little bit. Uh, it's pretty small. Ticket price is good. They need a toilet as well. We do need to give them a toilet. And it's, okay, it's scorching. They're starting to notice that it's a bit scorching. Um, also crime, what's been, oh, there's one bench has been vandalized. That's not a lot of vandalized stuff. That's That's one thing. Very, uh, very complaining guest. Right, let's delete a path section in the middle. I think that's the center, yep. And now we can put a tree in here. So let's move this bench over here and then we can add a tree in the middle. Now we need to filter this as well to be uh, grassland Africa because we're trying to use the, the trees that are from this region. And I have the perfect tree in mind to have a nice baobab tree. Is that how you say it? Baobab? Baobab. Um, but I'm not sure which one. That is a strong contender. I think maybe we'll go for this nice thick one. There. And now we can have maybe some planters around the outside. Okay, we've added some grass and some planters around there and that's a nice 
nice thick tree right in the center. So I think that's good. That provides a lot more shade to our to our areas generally. And we can put in some shading as well from the umbrellas. There must be umbrellas for these. Yes, there are. There we go. We'll put some of these in as well. There we go. Has that impacted temperature? It doesn't look like it. Yes, no, it has. It means that these, these areas are much cooler now, which is good. That's what we want. We've also got the inspector in our zoo. They're having a look at our habitat. Oh, they're leaving now. Well, hopefully they enjoyed reading about them and they did learn about them. Now, another thing you guys said actually was that we should probably have sections where we talk about each animal as far as the educational speakers, rather than having education for each animal like spread out across the habitat. Seeing as we've got three animals and we've got three or four, depending on how you look at this section, um, ways to look at them, it might be a good idea to separate them out into their sections. And what I'm gonna do is move the anteater, seeing as they're the most popular um, animal, the most appealing animal, I'm gonna move their forage box over to this side over here as well as their small feeder and this will mean that the anteaters get fed over this side of the zoo and then we can move the other food enrichments like because they're for different animals like the the small barrel feeder is for the capybara we can move that to this side and just make sure that the right feeders are there for the right animals like this is the bamboo feeder we'll move that to this side for the main wolves and then when they get more food enrichment as well we'll put that over here for the main wolves too but now we kind of have sections. So this section can be about the main walls and we can make sure we have enough education on just them, including the speaker. So this is gonna change to be the main wolf. I'm gonna do this for each section and just change it so that each area just teaches you about one of the species in the habitat. Okay, so I've just added a bit more education. I've moved things around so that the education boards aren't on the glass viewing panes anymore. Um, they're just here. Oh, this one's sticking out a bit funny. I think it needs to be turned a little bit and brought forward. But essentially, this is the uh, giant anteater side now. Um, so all of the education is relating to them because they're the most appealing species based on what our, our zoo says, our overview. Um, and then we've got the capybara section here on like the main thoroughfare of the zoo. And then we've got a little bit on all of them around the bedding. And then we've got the main wolf section over here. I think these look cute with the little umbrellas, don't they? I like it. They're, uh, they're very colorful. Right, let's start building our reptile house now. I'm using the New World wooden pieces to lay out a boundary to the building because they look nice and they tie in well with the existing staff building that we have. And I've added in some of the exhibit spaces so I know where they're gonna be to make sure that they all fit in the building that I'm making. One of our capybara are about to have offspring. Pipoca is about to have one. Oh, she's lying down. That means it's time. <gasps> Here they are. Little Francisca. And Elena. Or Elena. Not sure which one, but very cute nonetheless. Look at their little faces. Oh, they're so adorable. I love them so much. <laughs> They're so, so cute. Look at all the people watching them. What a great view. They literally just watch them give birth. How cool is that? 
Now we need to look at these little ones' names. A great idea I saw for one of them was Cappuccino, which I thought was very funny. And then another one we had was Maple. Thank you guys for giving your name suggestions. If you have any more name suggestions, please do leave them in the comments below. I do read them and I will add them to the name list. So a future animal may be named after your name suggestion. Okay, I've laid out kind of a foundation for how I want our reptile house to be. Um, we've got five exhibits in here, then we've got a walkthrough exhibit, and then another one in here. Now, I did have plans for nine, so I might see if I can add another two more exhibits to it. And it may just be that I extend, I might just extend this space over here to cover a little bit more area, and then we can add them in. Um, but essentially what I'm doing is just laying out the area I want them to be in. And don't worry about the path. I'm going to put a floor over the whole thing so you won't see it. But this is just where the guests can actually walk. And I don't want them to go to all sides of the exhibits because I want to do, I want to kind of integrate the exhibits to make it look a bit more like an actual habitat um, rather than just a screen. So I'm going to try and do that um, across all of the exhibits if I can. And then obviously we've got a nice walkthrough in the middle as well. Now in order to design the exhibits, we need to actually get our animals and see what their environment looks like when we put them in there. So for this zoo, we're gonna be having boa constrictors. So I'm gonna grab both of these because they are currently um, available and we need both to breed. So I'm gonna grab them for cash. We also need a common death adder. So we're going to grab the most appealing of these. And in fact, I think what we may do is rather than buying all of the animals up front, we'll just buy the animals that we actually need for each section of the of the reptile house and build it as we go. So let's do the South American section first. Now we've got our boa constrictor already from South America. We're choosing animals that live in the grassland biome, um, but just because it seems a little bit more ethical to keep them in the habitat that they're from. And it's a good way of filtering down the species that we're going to have in this zoo. So. We've got boa constrictors, we've got two of them and they live in a size of one to two. The males are two meters long and the females are 2.5, that's insane. And they can live for 30 years, which is crazy. So definitely gonna be a good addition to the zoo. Then we've also got our green iguana. Now we need to make sure we get one to two of them as well. Um, they live to 14 years and they're very, they're huge as well. They're 1.9 meters long, the males. Wow. They're also going to be a very cool addition. So let's grab some of them now. If we go into exhibit trading, we can search for green iguana and we're going to grab two of them now sorted by appeal. So it's going to be this female and this male. And now let's put them into our zoo. So you don't have to quarantine exhibit animals in the same way that you do habitat animals. So they don't need to see the void. All you have to do is select both of them and then send to zoo and then click where you want to put them. And we want to put our boa constrictors in this habitat here. And we want to put our green iguanas in this habitat here. Now our work isn't done. We need to click on the habitat and they all gonna need power. So that's something we have to consider. We're gonna need power. So what I'm going to do is just select all of our animals and put them in the trade center again. And they'll be looked after there absolutely fine until we have enough to get a solar panel 
which I think are three thousand um, dollars, and then we'll place a solar panel in, and they'll have power, and we can carry on. Oh my goodness! I've just got a notification that Heather has had a baby giant anteater, which is a really strange phrase. Look at them! Look at their little faces. They're so cute. Wow, these are adorable. Oh, look at look at all of them just getting on so well. They just they just love it, don't they? All of them together. Now, this little anteater is going to be called Susie. Look at them run. They're so cute. I love it. I love it. They're just coming up to the guests. There's not even food out here. Like, they're just interested in seeing the guests, I guess. I'm glad they're all living their best lives. Ah, I realize it's only 2,000 for a solar panel, not 3,000. So we have enough money now. I'm going to grab one of these. And I'm going to put out the front of the building again um, and do a similar thing that I did with the staff room where I basically incorporated it into the, the wooden facade of the front of the building. I would put them on the roof, but then the uh, mechanics need to get to them. So in the game, we've got to go with the game mechanics. I just feel like the easiest way is to uh, put them like this. And then we'll just put a wooden flooring there. And we need to make sure that our walls are on the right layer, which I don't think they are. I think they need to be one back. Because they're not lining up quite right. There we go. Now we should have power. We can put our animals back in. So let's put our green iguanas in here and our boa constrictors in here. Now I'm going to pause the game because they're not going to be in the right conditions. So their welfare has severe issues because basically it's not the right temperature, but it is actually the right humidity. So that's that's lucky, I guess. If we go to climate, we can change the temperature and the humidity of the exhibit. So let's what do they want? They want 23 to 31 degrees and they want 60 to 80%. So the humidity is actually perfect for them, but the temperature needs changing. The middle between 23 and 31 is 27. So we're going to just put it to the, the middle temperature, which should be perfect for them. And that will decrease down to 27 and give them the right temperature. I'm going to do the same thing for the climate of the iguanas, except they're not happy with their humidity. They need 50 to 60. So we're going to pull this down to 55. And 26 to 31, we can't do an exact midpoint, but we'll put it to 28 degrees because that is definitely good for them. So both of these will decrease on both habitats. And you can see the welfare is going up as we speak as the temperature comes down. Now we're getting a bunch of alerts here because we need to add them into our work zone. So I'm going to click on staff work zone. I am going to put them in the central hub as well. I'm just going to add all of these into the central hub. Um, we will probably need new keepers at some point to just to help with the workload, but we'll see how we get on for now. Now we can improve the layout. This is basically enrichment for our exhibit species. We can improve this by doing research on the animals. And actually, it probably, we earn enough profit in this zoo that we can probably afford to get a second vet to start doing some more research. Because I imagine they are plowing through, oh, they finished the main wolf research. Wow, that's amazing. Well, let's get them started on the giant anteater and then we'll get a new vet that can come and do the exhibit research. And the reason we've got the large research center in our staff building, which is this building here, is we can have multiple researchers doing research at the same time. So if we go to our zoo tab and click vet research, we can grab our new vet and drag them onto boa constrictor research and they will start doing that as well for us. Now we know what their internal environment looks like though, we can start adding in some decorations so it kind of looks like it fits within a wider tank because I always think that these are quite small. So in our ethical zoo, we are building larger tanks even if the game won't technically let us do it. <laughs> Thank you.
Now my approach to making all of these large exhibits is essentially trying to find construction pieces, nature pieces, pretty much anything I can that will match the ground, the plants and the lighting of the existing exhibit. So we can essentially make it much bigger. If you forget the glass panels on either side of the exhibit, you would think the whole thing was one unit. And that's essentially what we're going for because in order to try and make them as ethical as we can, we're gonna increase the size of the exhibits to give the animals more space. So you'll see I do quite a lot of just looking at the different plants against the ones that are in there and just finding what works, like what looks like it works. And I was surprised by some of the plants I actually chose, but I feel like they do blend in quite well and just give the illusion that it's one habitat.
Now we've built our first two exhibits. Let's rename them in the animal panel. So if we go to exhibits now, you can see, ah, oh, the running cost. Yeah, I mean, we've got the walkthroughs 100 and then the rest of them are 50. So it's so, it's so like minimal for the benefit we're gonna have from the animals. Um, let's call this green iguana and this one boa constrictor. Okay, we're almost done with our habitats now. Now we need to go to our media education and put on the exhibit education boards. Now I'm gonna turn off align to surface and we can just add these in all along the walls. And essentially this is gonna be like the habitat boards, but for the exhibits. And we also need donation boxes. Now I think I'm gonna put these more in like the middle of the room than against the glass. Cause again, I don't really wanna obscure the, the view, especially with the exhibits. Like there's so, there's such a small area to look through. And I think I'm gonna change this flooring to use the roof pieces. Cause the floor is quite thick and uh, people's feet are disappearing I've noticed. Uh, while changing the floors, I accidentally deleted the building, which has kicked our animals into the trade center, but I'll put them back in a second. I'm just going to finish up adding in some educational speakers so that each section can have a little talk on the animal. I'm just gonna add a couple of TVs as well because I think they're cute. Uh, just showing the animals that are in the habitat. And I've done that just by clicking on the image and then finding, if you scroll down, they've got every image from within the game. So you can find the boa constrictor on this list. Uh, there it is. And that's their kind of habitat education, but it's just on a smaller screen than like a habitat education board. I think these two exhibits are done. Green iguanas are great climbers and they can fall up to 18 meters without sustaining an injury, which I definitely can't do. They're also great swimmers and they use their strong tails to propel them through the water. Green iguanas have a flap of skin hanging from their chin called a dewlap and the movement of it is a method of communication between iguanas. Green iguana hatchlings have a special tooth called a caruncle that is used for breaking through the shell of their egg and it falls off shortly after hatching. Green iguanas also have a rudimentary third eye on the top of their head known as a pineal eye, which is sensitive to changes in light levels and movement. The green iguana live throughout Central America, Northern South America and the Caribbean. And although they're named green iguanas, they occur in many colors, commonly green, blue, brown and orange. And the color of them often depends on their location of origin. Boa constrictors and pythons have a rudimentary pelvis and vestigial hind legs inside their body. And the scale and pattern of the boa constrictors depends on where they're from. There are a huge range of colors in the wild and even more in captivity due to selective breeding. Boa constrictors give birth to live young and they continue to shed their skin every two to four months as they grow throughout their life. Contrary to popular belief, Boa constrictors do not kill their prey by suffocation, but by cutting off the blood supply to vital organs. Boa constrictors are native to Central and South America, and they're actually a ubiquitous species split into nine subspecies, all of which are capable of thriving in most environments, but they're mostly found in rainforests, coastal areas, and semi-deserts. We can see as well now that the most appealing exhibit species we have is the green iguana, which is cool. And what do our guests think now? They still think it's small, but I think the ticket price is good. So we could probably put the ticket price up a bit. They do need a toilet. They still need a toilet. Now I think we're ready to do these two exhibits over here. And for that, we're not doing the common death adder yet. That is going to go into our middle exhibit. Now we're gonna do the giant tiger land snail, which sounds awesome. <laughs> Um, and this is the most appealing one. So we're going to get this one and that one. I wonder what group sizes they live in, actually. Let's have a look. They live in groups of one to six. So I think we will just get two of them and then we'll let them breed and let the rest of them populate. Promiscuous self-fertilization. That's interesting. We're going to put them in with two of them so they don't have to self-fertilize if they don't want to. And we're going to put them in this habitat here. 
And then the other animal we're going to get is the Puff Adder. And we're going to have this sort of the best appeal one. We're going to get these two. And we're going to put them in the other exhibit we have here, exhibit two. Now, these animals are both found in the African grasslands and the puff adder is actually found in Asia as well. But we're going to keep this side of the building to be more Africa themed. This side of the building, we're going to add some South America decorations to. And then the middle is kind of Central America where we've got our common death adder. We're going to just cycle through the dawn because it's quite hard to see what we're actually doing. Oh, and before I get too far, we need to make sure that the climate's okay for these guys, which it isn't. So yeah, oh, we've just got an alert for it as well. Okay, so they need to be between 23 and 36 degrees and between 40 and 50 humidity. So we definitely need 50 degrees humidity because it needs to be between 40 and 60. And for 23 and 36, again, we're not going to have a center here, but I think 29 is good enough for a sweet spot here. And we're going to name this exhibit Giant Tiger Land Snail. And this exhibit is already in the ideal humidity range, but again, it's 23 to 31, so it's going to be a 27 degree habitat. And we're going to call the exhibit Puff Adder. There you go, that's getting a bit lighter now. Right, let's get some mulch in here. Oh, our inspector's report is ready. Education, yeah, okay. They're not happy with that, but they're happy with the cleanliness. We can live with that. The education will get better, it's fine. Oh no, we've got animal welfare, welfare problems. What's wrong with them? They're social, they're stressed and trying to hide. Oh, the babies may be a bit less, um, a bit less comfortable around people. I thought that they were quite comfortable. Let's have a look. Oh, they're neutral. Oh, okay, but guests can enter the habitats, so you'd think that they'd be kind of okay. There's plenty of places to hide. They just need to go into the wooded area. Let's see if we just move them, whether they'll calm down like that. We can use our god powers to fling a cardboard box across the habitat. Then they should calm down. Social. Yeah, their stress is going back up. They're good. They're okay. Which is a good thing in this case. Stress going up is normally a bad thing. But they just needed a bit of quiet time. Well, if, if that keeps happening, we can, uh, we'll have a look at it. It could just be that there's more people in the zoo than normal. Um, we can also tell guests to be quiet with like the be quiet signs. That may help. Um, we don't need protesters here though. She's okay. She's all right. We just didn't realize. We didn't realize, guys. It's fine. It's still an ethical zoo, I think.
Okay, apart from the education, I think this habitat is pretty much done, which is cool. So we've got our giant tiger snails in there and we'll just now do the puff adder habitat. And this is going to be a bit different because it's all sandy. Okay, we finally finished our, both of our habitats. We've got a nice large enclosure here for our giant tiger land snails. And we have a nice large enclosure for our puff adders. The giant tiger land snail is the largest species of land snail in the world, with the largest individuals reaching a length and diameter of 30 centimeters by 15 centimeters. They're huge. The snails have mouth parts called radulae that are covered in many tiny teeth used to feed by rasping them against vegetation. The giant tiger land snail has been accidentally introduced to the USA and the Caribbean, where it's actually considered a pest now. Unfortunately, the giant tiger land scales are threatened by habitat loss and overhunting by humans, and in Ghana, they're considered a delicacy and often hunted for food. The giant tiger land snail lives in the woodland areas of West Africa. They have a grey body and a conical shell that's yellow, orange or tan with black stripes. The distinctive pattern of their shell is what gave them their name. The species is hermaphroditic, which means it possesses both the male and the female reproductive parts, so there aren't any distinct males or females. The puff adder is a species of venomous snake that is widespread throughout sub-Saharan Africa and the southern Middle East. It's distinguishable by its squat body, broad head and dull scales. It's a slow moving snake, but it can reach great speeds when it's disturbed. The puff adders can give birth to a great number of live young, with one female recorded as giving birth to 156 young. Puff adders are responsible for most snake bite deaths in Africa, and the venom of a puff adder can cause extreme pain, low blood pressure and necrosis of tissue. The puff adder is extremely greedy and has been known to eat itself to death in captivity if offered unlimited food, so we won't be doing that here. It's an aggressive and bad-tempered snake, often remaining ready to attack and never settling when in captivity, but we're going to do our best with these adders. And we've just got a challenge reward for adopting and placing two different exhibit species, which is great. So I'm going to claim that for a bit of extra cash. 
And now let's put in our common death adder, which is the last exhibit in this room. And we've got another deserty biome. So it's going to be similar to the puff adder, but I'm going to do that now. Okay, we've just put the common death adders in here and we're going to change the name of Exhibit 7 to Common Death Adder. And we need to set the climate for them. So they're happy with their humidity. It's at 70%, which is halfway between 60 and 80. But 23 to 31 is going to be another 27 degree habitat. So that should be good for them. If we hit play, that should go back down. There you go, they're happy, which is great. We do need to work on the research for all of these exhibits because then we'll start to unlock things for them. Oh, and we need to sort this out because we don't want them doing that in any of the habitats. So if we set up some barriers that it will stop guests from walking through where we don't want them to go. And we need to add in our education and donation bins. And we've got reduced crime because we haven't had crime in three months, but I don't think we've reduced it. We've just not had crime because we haven't hired a security guard. Now it looks like our habitat's doing quite well, our exhibits, but we do need a bit of decoration here and we're gonna need some bins because people have already started to drop their coffees and slices of pizza or whatever that is on the floor. So let's start decorating and maybe put some benching in as well. So our guests can sit down, relax and throw away their rubbish.
Okay, so I feel like we've done as much decorating as I want to here. Some of it's a bit silly, some of it's a bit more fun, but I feel like it captures the theme and we've got the different areas in there, like the South America and the Africa themes. Now we should probably dive in and look at our common death adders because we've not looked at them yet. The common death adder has the longest fangs of any Australian venomous snake. And although highly venomous, the common death adder isn't actually aggressive and is rarely a danger to humans. The snake hides under leaf litters for long periods of time, twitching its grub-like tail to lure prey in, and then strikes when any unsuspecting animals move across its hiding place. The common death adder has the fastest strike of all venomous snakes in Australia. And it's thought that the name death adder was originally death adder, because common death adders, like all snakes, can't hear airborne sounds and instead feel vibrations on the ground. The common death adder lives in the grasslands, forests and brushlands of eastern and southern Australia. And although this species isn't endangered, it is threatened by the presence of cane toads, which is an invasive species in Australia. Cane toads often eat young snakes, and then when the adult snakes prey upon them, they're poisoned by the toxins in the toad's skin, so they die as a result. Next episode, we definitely need to continue expanding our reptile house. Although we can't really call it that, can we? Because it's got things other than reptiles in it. And we're going to add other animals that aren't reptiles in the next episode. So let me know in the comments what you think we should call this building. But for now, it's going to be called our reptile house. And hopefully you guys have enjoyed the decorations on the inside as well and how we've expanded the exhibits. If you've liked this video, please give it a like. It really helps the channel out. And I'll see you in the next one.